It's Monday, March 21st. Historic confirmation hearings get underway in the United States Senate for the first African-American woman ever nominated to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. Let me just acknowledge the fact that this is not normal. It's never happened before. The Senate is poised right now to break another bat barrier. We are on the precipice of shattering another ceiling. The nomination of Katanji Brown Jackson fulfills President Biden's campaign promise to place a black woman on the nation's highest court. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky rejects Russia's offer of safe passage for civilians in the besieged city of Mariupol, seeking protection in exchange for the surrender of the city. The offer comes as Russian forces step up bombing and artillery attacks around the country. President Biden warns the nation that Russia may launch cyber attacks against critical U.S. infrastructure targets as the war in Ukraine grinds on. The latest coronavirus variant begins showing up in the San Francisco Bay Area, but local health officials say vaccinated and boosted people still have good protection against it. In the United Kingdom, the BA2 subvariant growing faster than the initial Omicron strain. And hundreds of refinery workers at Chevron's Richmond facility go on strike today after the company and the United Steelworkers Union Union failed to reach a contract agreement. From Pacifica Radio, KBFA in Berkeley, KBFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Maracle. The United States Senate today began hearings on President Joe Biden's nomination of Katanji Brown Jackson to the United States Supreme Court. If confirmed, Jackson would be the first African-American woman ever to serve as a Supreme Court justice. The nomination fulfills Biden's campaign promise to nominate an African-American woman to the court. And with Vice President Kamala Harris as a potential deciding vote, her confirmation is widely expected. But Republican senators are using the hearings as an opportunity to blast the Biden administration as soft on crime. Christopher Martinez filed this report. Thank you for convening this hearing and for considering my nomination as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Federal Appeals Court Judge Katanji Brown Jackson faced the Senate Judiciary Committee Monday for the first day of hearings on her nomination to the High Court. I have dedicated my career to ensuring that the words engraved on the front of the Supreme Court building, equal justice under law, are a reality and not just an ideal. Jackson, who would be the Supreme Court's first African-American woman to become a justice, described her career and family background. She also mentioned that she shares the same birthday as Constance Baker Motley, who in 1966 became the first African-American woman appointed as a federal judge. Jackson's opening statement came at the end of the day's hearing, which was mostly taken up with opening statements by senators on the committee. As so often happens in the narrowly divided Senate these days, those statements showed a stark difference between, on the one side, Democrats like Cory Booker of New Jersey. I, I, I just feel this sense of overwhelming joy. And on the other, Republicans like Tom Cotton of Arkansas. We are witnessing a breakdown of society. Judge Jackson has served as a federal judge for about nine years before her nomination, more than many of the current justices had when they were confirmed. She also worked for two years as a federal public defender. The last Supreme Court justice with real criminal defense experience was Thurgood Marshall, who retired in 1991. But many Republicans view that experience as a liability. In his opening remarks, Senator Cotton blasted the left, President Joe Biden, critical race theory, crime, illegal aliens, and abortion. Career criminals are committing violent crimes and going free under the guise of a supposedly more equitable justice system. 
And liberal judges who have more sympathy for the victimizers than for the victims are a big part of the problem. Republican Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee took aim at transsexual athletes, mask mandates, and anti-racist education in kindergarten. I can only wonder, what's your hidden agenda? Is it to let violent criminals, cop killers, and child predators back to the streets? Is it to restrict parental rights and expand government's reach into our schools and our private family decisions? Is it to support the radical left's attempt to pack the Supreme Court? Jackson's nomination has support from many liberal organizations, as well as from some law enforcement groups, like the Fraternal Order of Police and the International Association of Police Chiefs. But Republican senators focused on her support from progressives. Lindsey Graham is a Republican from South Carolina. I want to know about your judicial philosophy, because people on the left, the far extreme part of the left, believe that you were the best bet. And I want to know why they reached that conclusion. Maybe there's no explanation you can give us, but let, we'll, we'll talk about that. Graham and other Republicans say Jackson has been supported by what they described as a liberal dark money campaign on her behalf. Democrat Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island fired back against that charge. She is before us on the basis of her own merit, not on the recommendation of a secretive right-wing donor operation, hiding behind anonymous multi-million dollar donations, and aimed at capturing the United States Supreme Court as if it were some 19th century railroad commission. The unpleasant fact is that the present court is the court that dark money built. The hearing is scheduled to continue with senators asking Jackson questions on Tuesday and Wednesday, followed by witnesses on Thursday. Democrat Amy Klobuchar says the hearing comes at a moment when democracy is under attack, noting the war in Ukraine. And this horrendous war against evil and the courage of the Ukrainian people is happening at the very same time our country is opening our minds after being separated through a two-year pandemic from our neighbors, not only around the world, but in our own country, in our own towns. This moment bestows upon us a new opportunity to see one another again and to be part of our own democracy. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News, KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. KPFA will be broadcasting the confirmation hearings both tomorrow and on Wednesday when Senators question Jackson. Our coverage begins at 6 a.m. and the hearing is expected to run well into the afternoon. The Supreme Court says Justice Clarence Thomas remains hospitalized in Washington after being diagnosed with an infection, but he does not have COVID-19. The high court announced yesterday that the 73-year-old conservative had entered the hospital Friday after experiencing flu-like symptoms and underwent tests. The court said that Thomas was diagnosed with an infection and was being treated with intravenous antibiotics. The court did not explain its delay in announcing Thomas's hospitalization. As it continued its barrage of the besieged city of Mariupol, Russia demanded that Ukrainians put down their arms and raise white flags in exchange for safe passage out of town. Ukraine rejected the conditions. It came hours after officials said Russian forces had bombed an art school that was serving as a shelter. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, said about 400 civilians were sheltering at the art school when it was struck by a Russian bomb. His translated remarks appeared on Al Jazeera. The blockade of Mariupol will go down in history of responsibility for war crimes. To do this to a peaceful city, what the occupiers did, it is terror that will be remembered for centuries to come. The European Union's foreign minister, Josep Borrell, recalled the devastating or called the devastating Russian attack on this strategic southern port city a war crime. This is something awful. We have to condemn in the stronger terms. This is a war crime, a massive war crime was happening in Mariupol. The city will be completely destroyed and people will be are dying. 
We will continue working and supporting Ukraine with all of our resources. We will continue talking about what kind of sanctions we can think again more, especially related with energy. Selling in a Kiev neighborhood devastated a shopping center. Emergency officials said that the overnight shelling near the city center killed at least eight people. Authorities in Odessa accused Russian forces of damaging civilian houses in a strike on that Black Sea port city today. Ukraine's prosecutor general said a Russian shell attack struck a chemical plant outside the city of Sumy, causing a leak in a 50-ton tank of ammonia that took hours to contain. Reporter Simon Marks has more. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is rejecting Russian calls for the surrender of the city of Mariupol on the Black Sea coast, saying he doesn't believe Moscow's offer of safe passage for those civilians seeking protection. Ukrainian officials say at least eight people died when the Russians shelled a residential area of Kiev overnight and obliterated a shopping center on the outskirts of the Ukrainian capital. The Black Sea port of Odessa was also shelled by Russian naval forces. President Zelensky accused the Russians of war crimes in Mariupol. Andriy Zagorodnyuk is Ukraine's former defense minister and a current advisor to the country's vice prime minister. Mariupol is the is the living hell uh, right now. It's uh, it's the place where uh, which is surrounded by Russians and they don't let people out, and they wait until they die. Uh, without water, without food and so on. And we're talking about a couple hundred thousand people. Reporter Neil Hauer has just left Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city, where he says Russian forces are deliberately targeting civilians. People, have, they were telling us that, uh, you know, they, they used in the first two or three weeks of the war, they were they were mostly shelling at night. But now it's increasingly during the day as well. After the, the curfews lifted at 6 a.m., and people are able to go outside to, to shops to gather supplies. The Russians wait till the, the lines are, are forming and people are in the shops and then they begin shelling again. The Kremlin today acknowledged the deaths of nearly 10,000 Russian troops in Ukraine. That's two-thirds the number of Russian forces who died over a decade in Afghanistan. The United Nations says an estimated 10 million people have now fled their homes in Ukraine. Nearly three and a half million of them have crossed the borders into other countries. Simon Marks reporting. Ukrainian President Zelensky spoke by video link to the Israeli parliament over the weekend, thanking Israel for its efforts to broker talks with Russia. He praised Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett for trying to help find a negotiation track with Russia so that, quote, we sooner or later start talking with Russia, possibly in Jerusalem. Mary Sherman filed this report. What will be left? of our cities in Ukraine after this terrible war. With advances by the Russian military driving up casualties, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky addressed the Israeli parliament Sunday. Speaking through a translator, Zelensky questioned Israel's reluctance to sell its Iron Dome missile defense system to his nation. The Ukrainians have made their choice eight years ago. We saved Jews, and this is why the Israeli people now need to choose to make a similar decision. Zelensky said he's ready to negotiate with Russian President Vladimir Putin, but cautioned that failed attempts at a truce between the countries could lead to a third world war. U.S. officials warn Russian steps that would limit travel by some civilians there could evolve into what amounts to concentration camps. As the first and only Ukrainian-American in Congress, Representative Victoria Sparks of Indiana argues that the U.S. and its allies have a responsibility to help. Ukrainians fight in this war for all of us, for the peace in the world, for world order, and really, you know, their bastion right now of freedoms that they're on the front line. President Joe Biden is expected to rally support for Ukraine when he meets with NATO this week in Belgium. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov says more progress must be made in talks with Ukraine before Russian President Vladimir Putin can meet his Ukrainian counterpart Zelensky. Peskov cited what he called the lack so far of significant movement. Ukrainian and Russian delegations have held several rounds of talks, both in person and more recently via video link. Zelensky has said he would be prepared to meet Putin directly to seek 
agreements on key issues. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. Ukraine's Nuclear Regulatory Agency says the radiation monitors around the Chernobyl nuclear power plant have stopped working. In 1986, Chernobyl was the site of the world's worst nuclear reactor meltdown. The Ukraine Nuclear Agency also said there are no longer firefighters available in the region to protect forests tainted by decades of radioactivity as the weather warms. The plant was seized by Russian forces on February 24th. According to today's statement, the combination of risks could mean a significant deterioration of the ability to control the spread of radiation, not just in Ukraine, but beyond the country's borders in weeks and months to come. <clears throat> Management of the Chernobyl plant said on Sunday that 50 staff members who had been working nonstop since the Russian takeover of the plant have been rotated out and replaced. <laughs> President Joe Biden today urged U.S. companies to make sure their digital doors are locked tight because of evolving intelligence that Russia is considering launching cyber attacks against critical U.S. infrastructure targets as the war in Ukraine continues. Addressing corporate CEOs at their quarterly meeting, Biden told the business leaders they have a patriotic obligation to harden their systems against such attacks. He said federal assistance is available should they want it, but that the decision is theirs alone. Biden said the administration has issued new warnings that based on evolving intelligence, Russia may be planning a cyber attack against us. The magnitude of Russia's cyber capacity is fairly consequential and it's coming, he said. Biden said the federal government is doing its part to prepare for an attack and warned the private sector CEOs that it also is in the national interest that they do the same. Biden's top cybersecurity aide, Ann Neuberger, expressed frustration at a White House press briefing earlier in the day that some critical infrastructure entities have ignored alerts from federal agencies to fix known problems in software that could be exploited by Russian hackers. Critical infrastructure, power, water, many hospitals in the United States are owned by the private sector. For those sectors where we can mandate measures, like oil and gas pipelines, we have. But it's ultimately the private sector's responsibility in our current authority structure to do those steps, to use those resources to take those steps. So the purpose here is to say, Americans rely on those critical services, please act, and we're here to support with the resources we have. The federal government has been providing warnings to U.S. companies of the threats posed by Russian state hackers since long before the country invaded Ukraine last month. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency has launched a Shields Up campaign aimed at helping companies strengthen their defenses and has urged companies to back up their data, turn on multi-factor authentication, and take other steps to improve cyber hygiene. Neuberger says there's no intelligence suggesting a specific Russian cyber attack against U.S. targets. But she did say there has been an increase in preparatory activity, like scanning websites and hunting for vulnerabilities that's common among nation-state hackers. There is no evidence of any specific um, cyber attack that we're anticipating for. There is some preparatory activity that we're seeing, and that is what we shared in a classified context with companies who we thought might be affected. And then we're lifting up a broader awareness here in this, in this warning. Russia is considered a hacking powerhouse, but it's offensive cyber attacks thus far since it invaded Ukraine have been muted compared to what some feared. Russia has carried out significant cyber attacks against Ukraine in years past, including a devastating one in 2017 that spread far and wide and caused more than $10 billion in damage globally. Neuberger said Russia's cyber attacks against Ukraine are ongoing, <clears throat> although she did not provide specifics. She said the Biden administration has made clear there will be consequences if Russia engages with the U.S. in cyberspace.
President Biden today held a call on Ukraine with the leaders of France, Britain, Germany, and Italy. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. They discussed their serious concerns about Russia's brutal tactics in Ukraine, including its attacks on civilians. They underscored their continued support for Ukraine, including by providing security assistance to the brave Ukrainians who are defending their country from Russian aggression and humanitarian assistance to the millions of Ukrainians who have fled the violence. They also reviewed recent diplomatic efforts in support of Ukraine's uh, effort to reach a ceasefire. Sorry told her daily White House briefing that the administration is monitoring the impact of the war in Ukraine on the world's food supply and on farming supplies like fertilizer. Ukraine is a major exporter of grain and fertilizer. While we're not expecting a food shortage here at home, uh, we do anticipate that um, higher energy fertilizer, wheat, and corn prices could impact the price of growing and purchasing critical food, suppli food supplies for countries around the world. And early estimates from the World Bank suggest disproportionate impacts on low and middle income countries, including in Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. And actually, and Ukraine is a big um, exporter of fertilizer. So as it relates to even that need in the United States, in other parts of the world. That's something that we're continuing to closely assess as well. The New York Times reports that Ukrainian farms are about to miss critical planting and harvesting seasons and that European fertilizer plants are significantly cutting production because of high energy prices. Farmers from Brazil to Texas are cutting back on fertilizer, threatening the size of the next harvests. European foreign and defense ministers are discussing the European Union's next steps in addressing Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The foreign ministers of Ireland and Lithuania want more targeted sanctions against Russia's energy sector. There is division on that issue, though, given the dependence of many European countries on Russian natural gas. Rosie Burchard reports from Brussels. It's the start of a big week of big meetings in Brussels, with NATO leaders including US President Joe Biden expected in town on Thursday. European Union foreign and defence ministers are preparing the ground with a long day of talks on Monday. They're expected to endorse a document laying out long-term plans for EU defence policy. The closed-door talks are also likely to include a tussle on how to proceed when it comes to sanctioning Russia. Some EU countries, including Poland and Lithuania, are pushing for more sanctions now, while others are advocating for a more gradual approach as existing sanctions take effect. Rosie Burchard, Brussels. President Joe Biden will thank Poland's president for the country's efforts to shelter Ukrainian refugees as part of his trip this week to Europe and a NATO summit. Poland is a crucial ally in the Ukraine crisis. It's hosting thousands of American troops and is taking in more people fleeing the war in Ukraine, more than two million than any other nation in the midst of the largest European refugee crisis in decades. KBFA reporter Jalen Herdman spoke to one of those refugees in Poland, a friend of hers, whom she met in the United States several years ago. Tatiana Poladko is a mother of three who grew up in Ukraine. I first met her in 2015 in Delaware when I babysat for her first child, Zoriana. Then, less than a year ago, she and her family moved back to Ukraine. The Russian army launched an attack against Ukraine on February 24th, which included missile attacks on major cities. At that time, Tatiana and her family were living about 20 minutes away from downtown Kiev. I called Tatiana up by phone on March 7th to find out how she was doing. By then, she and her family had fled to Poland, where they were staying in a hotel. Literally overnight, like everything changed. So... Thursday, February 24th, uh, when I jumped out of bed because of an explosion that I heard and that shook the house. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget that feeling. Uh, apparently, it happened in Kiev, which is a few kilometers away. You know, it, it was just like a moment of sheer, sheer fear. Tatiana and her husband, Andre, gave up their car shortly after arriving in Ukraine. And now they needed to get out of an active war zone with a family of six. Tatiana, her husband, Anton Ray, their three kids, ages two, three, and seven, 
and Tatiana's 81-year-old father, who was recently recovering from a severe case of COVID-19. At that time, right after the Russian invasion, transportation in Kiev was quickly overrun by people trying to flee the violence. Finally, Tatiana arranged a ride with a fellow parent from her children's daycare. Two families piled into one car. You know, the road was empty at first, you know, which was great, but also eerie. She was, you know, speeding very, very fast. At different times, we would hear explosions. At different times, we heard just like, uh, you know, gun, you know, bunch of gun shootings. And, you know, like she was not stopping when the traffic lights were like, go, 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 go. Um, uh, at one point we turned on the road and, you know, like there were two cars in front of us and everybody kind of pulled over. She couldn't see yet what was going on, but she kind of like, you know, you know, uh, hit the brakes and there was a tank right ahead. And so, you know, all three of these cars, including us, we're sitting there. That's the road we have to take, right? Where we are at. Like, do we drive towards the tank? Is it Ukrainian tank? Is it a Russian tank? Like, uh, what is going to happen? But then to our, greatest, greatest, greatest happiness that the tank turned into the woods. And so we're like, okay, we're going. Traveling by car and then by train, the family eventually made their way to Lviv, a city in eastern Ukraine. From there, they found a group of volunteers at the train station who were driving people to the Polish border. One agreed to take Tatiana's family. He tried his very, very best to get us as close as possible to where, you know, pedestrian uh, uh, crossing could be uh, and we we couldn't really even tell like how far it was where we ended but at a certain point it was just like bumper to bumper and like not moving for an hour <laughs> and so we we're like alright we're gonna go and little did I realize that we were nowhere even close to the pedestrian crossing and so you know I was like Jesus like we will have like to walk for like miles and so all of these people start walking, like some elderly woman like fell, you know, other people are picking her up, you know, like older folks with their cane, you know, kids, you know, mommies with newborns. Um, and it was just like really painful sight to see mostly women, women and children, but there were some families where their husbands were still there. But we saw, you know, these, you know, tears and embraces where people not knowing if they're going to see each other again just like so much tragedy so much so much tragedy um so i mean i uh, you know i cry easy these days you know you know cry there the whole time just like people packed in a suitcase small suitcase the entire life and just like left so the family tatiana carrying her two-year-old child with her husband and father carrying the luggage and their two other children walked for hours through the border and into Poland. And that's where they were when I spoke with Tatiana. I asked how her family's doing now. We are much better than we were. You know, we're in a hotel right now and cannot be in a hotel forever. So, you know, decisions, 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 figuring out what to do next. You know, it's like really, really hard in moments like this for those of us who are not on the front lines, lots of my friends are on the front lines in one way or the other. And I'm sitting in a hotel in Warsaw, you know, uh, and it's like, what do I have complain about, to complain about? Um, we're not in the line of fire, thank God, anymore. But yeah, but it sucks. It like really, really sucks. You know, and it's like every day we go through these things of like stay in Warsaw because maybe in the next few weeks we'll be able to go back home. And then like, okay, no, that's naive. <laughs> you know, that's yesterday I was looking for schools for the kids, thinking we'll ride out the rest of the school year here, but was not getting much luck finding like apartments, like, you know, any type of suitable housing, you know, I mean, Warsaw has such a high number of Ukrainians now. Today, today we are like, maybe we should keep moving. <laughs> so I'm still, I'm still kind of giving Warsaw another try, but might, might need to, to keep it moving to get somewhere where um, we can settle for 
for at least a few months. Tatiana is one of three million refugees who fled Ukraine into other countries in the last three weeks and who are now waiting to see what comes next. For KPFA, I'm Jalen Herdman. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF, Fresno, online, kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast airing each night at 6 o'clock with a half-hour edition on the weekends. All the newscasts archived online at kpfa.org. They're also available as podcasts. I'm Mark Miracle. The Los Angeles Unified School District, which is the largest U.S. school district still requiring masks for staff and students, says it will lift the mask mandate on Wednesday as COVID-19 infection rates continue to plunge. The L.A. school district says it reached an agreement with a teachers union on the issue. However, the district is still recommending indoor masking. California's public health officials reported that daily average of new cases over seven days was six and a half per 100,000 people. That compares with a case rate of more than 72 per 100,000 back in December. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Anthony Fauci, though, is warning that the U.S. is likely to see at least a slight increase in coronavirus cases as the more infectious BA2 subvariant of the Omicron variant spreads through the country. We likely will see an uptick in cases uh, as we've seen in the European countries, particularly the UK, where they've had the same situation as we've had now. They have a BA2, they have a relaxation of some of the restrictions such as indoor masking, and there's a waning of immunity. Hopefully we won't see a surge. I don't think we will. Fauci said the subvariant of Omicron was 50 to 60 percent more transmissible than the very first infectious strain of Omicron. Dr. John Schwarzenberg, clinical professor emeritus of infectious diseases at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health, told PFA's upfront program that he too is concerned about the BA2 subvariant. I feel really unsure as to what's going to happen. Of course, I felt unsure like all of us throughout the pandemic, but right now it feels like a different time. By that I mean in the past we just sort of waited to see what this virus was going to do and that's what we're doing now with B8.2. But this time we also have tools that we didn't have before. Like for example, the uh, oral medications that we could treat if we treat people if we get sick. So I just, I see this balance between the fact that we have interventions now that we can do to really keep people out of the hospital and save their lives for the first time, and the fact that we still can't tell what this virus is going to do to us. You can make a good argument either way in terms of what's going to happen over the next few weeks here in the United States. Uh, We could be the European pattern where we have... They came down and then they went right back up with BA 2.2. Um, we could be the Denmark pattern that really didn't have too much of a problem with BA 1, but had a terrible surge with BA 0.2. We could be the South African pattern that had a, a really bad surge with BA 1 and didn't see BA 2 at all. Uh, we could be the pattern that's seen in some of the Asian countries that um, really had a, a moderate time with BA 0.2 and And then uh, it seemed to uh, drop down or we could see something like Hong Kong and perhaps what's going on in China, a little less clear, where um, things are really not doing well at all. All of those things are possible for the United States. So uh, my guess is as good as anybody else's or as bad as anybody else's. England is giving its most vulnerable populations a second booster dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Vaccinations began today for people over 75 and those living in congregate care facilities. The National Health Service said more than 90% of people 75 and over had received a first booster dose, but immunity is waning. Ali Barrett reports from London. 
England is rolling out a further COVID-19 booster jab. People who are 75 years old and over, care home residents and those with weaker immune systems will be able to book a fourth dose. About 5 million people will be eligible. Health Secretary Sajid Javid says it will offer protection for those who need it. Our vaccination program has saved uh, countless lives. It's our wall of defence uh, against this uh, disease and it's helping us to learn to live with COVID. I've accepted the most recent advice from the JCVI, that's our group of independent you know, clinical advisors on vaccinations, that we should offer a spring booster dose and this will start uh, from today. From Feature Story News in London, I'm Ollie Barrett. Hong Kong's leader Carrie Lam says that the city will lift flight bans on nine countries, including Britain and the United States, on April 1st. She said it will also reduce quarantine time for travelers arriving in the city as coronavirus infections have plateaued in the latest outbreak. Lam also said plans for a citywide mass testing exercise have been put on hold after experts advised that it was not currently appropriate. Richard Kimba reports from Hong Kong. From April the 1st, Hong Kong is planning to scrap a ban on flights from nine countries, including the US, Australia and the UK, and reduce the mandatory hotel quarantine for incoming vaccinated travellers to one week. Initially, only Hong Kong residents will be allowed in, but the plan is to open that to all vaccinated visitors if there's no rebound in daily case numbers. The city is showing signs of recovering from its most serious COVID-19 outbreak. More than 5,000 people have died in the past few months and more than a million have been infected. The government says the situation is still severe but is improving enough to start relaxing the rules. Critics say the moves are too little, too late, and that the city should open up more quickly to allow business and daily life to recover and to restore Hong Kong's image as a finance and transport hub. Richard Kimber in Hong Kong. Opponents of a Trump-era immigration policy which allowed for the deportation of migrants at the border during the coronavirus pandemic are calling on the Biden administration to end the program. About 50 immigrant rights and civil rights advocates gathered this morning in front of the San Francisco Federal Building to demand the Biden administration end Title 42. The rally was held one day after the two-year anniversary of Title 42. Blaine Bookie is the legal director for the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies. He said Title 42 was specifically designed to close the U.S. border to black and brown asylum seekers. There's no doubt that the Trump administration and his advisor, Stephen Miller, the intention behind this policy was to keep out black and brown people from the United States. That's absolutely been the impact of this policy. Um, I was in Tijuana last week working with a Ukrainian family who was uh, permitted to enter after we brought attention to her case. And we're so glad that she and other Ukrainians have been able to find safety here in the United States. But black and brown asylum seekers that are stuck at the border and have been for many months, years at this point, in dangerous conditions, deserve the same protections. People at the rally, including former asylum seekers themselves, stood in front of the federal building holding signs with messages like end Title 42 and welcome with dignity. Some refugees talked about the harsh living conditions they experienced after being subjected to Title 42. Christine is a 21-year-old pregnant asylum seeker from El Salvador who, prepared, who preferred not to uh, give her last name. She said the law impacts pregnant women, children, and people of color most of all. She said she and many others suffered from health issues and police violence while at the U.S.-Mexico border. An interpreter translated her remarks. I continue to call for the termination of the former Trump administration's unlawful Title 42 policy that has continued to endanger the lives of thousands of individuals seeking refuge at our borders. We have a moral imperative to live by our values. Yet these leftover policies simply contradict everything we stand for as a country and should be permanently discarded, along with the many other unlawful Trump-era policies designed to punish and deter refugees from seeking safety. Christina said that U.S. Border Patrol agents sent her and other asylum seekers back to Mexico by bus. 
the day after their arrival there. She said she was trying to flee El Salvador because of the many kidnappings of women in the country. Senator Alex Padilla of California has repeatedly called on the Biden administration to end Title 42 and restart normal asylum procedures. Zahra Haji is Padilla's Bay Area field representative. He read a statement at the San Francisco rally on the senator's behalf. On December 23rd, 2021, I crossed the Rio Grande and presented myself to the immigration authorities at the border. I was there with two other women who brought their children. I told the agents I was very afraid to go back to my country, but they didn't say anything. They only made sure to take our information, photos, fingerprints, but they never asked us why we were coming, nor did they give us the right to an interview. They did not tell us, they did not let us call our families, nothing. I remember that I asked one of the agents for medical help because I felt very sick. They said they couldn't do anything. I spent that night detained. They only gave us a thin aluminum sheet and a small mattress, and the air conditioning was very cold, but I couldn't sleep. The Biden administration did recently end Title 42 for unaccompanied children, but the rule remains in place for adult asylum seekers. Legislation in Florida would do to the solar industry in that state the same thing that a regulation before the California Public Utilities Commission would do in this state, put a big crimp in solar's future. Advocates of alternative energy are appealing to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis to veto the measure. Tramel Gomes reports. Solar power advocates want the governor to veto a bill the legislature passed at the behest of the state's largest utility, Florida Power and Light, because they fear it would gut the rooftop solar industry. If it becomes law, utilities would pay solar users less money for the excess energy they produce. They now get a full retail rate for that power. Heaven Campbell with the group Solar United Neighbors is among 76 groups and businesses that sent a letter to DeSantis on Thursday. We believe that this is a bad bill. This is a bill that's going to cost Florida families their jobs, their economic livelihood, and it's also going to be taking away customer choice. Um at the behest of a monopoly utility. The utility companies see the current credits for customers who use solar as a tax on customers without net metering. Duke Energy has said the bill strikes a balance between consumers and the solar industry. Critics have said passage of the bill would cut off cheaper domestic energy sources and would even help Russian President Vladimir Putin. Campbell calls the bill a job killer in what is a growing industry. She adds it stands to impact moderate and low-income Floridians the most. When a customer owns their own solar, they're able to control their own utility bill. And that's extremely important for Florida families. Solar is actually not just for the wealthy and a lot of solar customers, the majority are not wealthy. We know this from the utility's own demographic. In statements, Florida Power and Light has said it leads the nation in expanding cost-effective large-scale solar and also supports customers who choose to buy private rooftop solar systems. Backers of the bill call the solar incentives a regressive tax and say the bill would make solar energy more equitable for all. This is Tramel Gomes for Florida News Connection. In New York, the state legislature has until April 1st to approve Governor Kathy Hochul's budget. And environmental advocates are pushing for the fiscal plan to include policies that move buildings off of fossil fuels. Emily Scott has that story. Hochul's budget includes $250 million for electrifying homes as part of a plan to get 2 million homes in the state electrified or electric ready by 2030. During a Wednesday news conference hosted by the Renewable Heat Now campaign, Lonnie Portis of Harlem-based group We Act for Environmental Justice said, it's about addressing indoor air pollution that can lead to negative health outcomes for communities of color. There's an opportunity to ensure that neighborhoods that are hit first and worst with air pollution and climate change see development that are all electric. And building electric also enables New York to meet its climate targets in a way that ensures everyone has a safe, warm, healthy home. New York leads the nation in premature deaths resulting from air pollution caused by burning fossil fuels in buildings for heating, hot water, and cooking. The campaign is asking for $1 billion in the budget to fund all electric or electric-ready affordable housing. 
The campaign also supports the fossil-free heating tax credit and sales tax exemption, which would incentivize the move to geothermal heat pump systems. Oneida County resident Maggie Riley installed an air source heat pump in 2020. It's kept her home warm while reducing her carbon footprint. We must pass the legislation that electrifies New York now. The urgency of this action can't be understated. If anybody wants to learn about these air source heat pumps, they totally work in cold climate. And we have cold climate here in central New York. The tax credit and exemption have been introduced in the Senate and Assembly. The coalition is also calling for the passage of the All-Electric Building Act, which requires new buildings to have all-electric space and water heating and appliances. It passed the Senate Housing Committee on Wednesday. I'm Emily Scott with New York News Connection. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno online at (laughs) kpfa.org. This is Kat Brooks. I'm an actor, activist, and freedom fighter. And I'm Brian Edwards Teekert. I mostly do journalism, which kind of sounds boring now. And together, we host Upfront, KPFA's local two-hour morning magazine. We bring you breaking news, debates, deep dives. Reporting on City Hall and the State House. Housing and transportation. Prisons and police. And everything big that happened while you were sleeping. And it means the two of us get to hang out with you at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. Richmond's Chevron Refinery is operating without its union workforce today. Hours before its workers were set to go on strike at midnight last night, plant management expelled them from the plant and brought in non-union strike breakers. More than 500 workers did walk off the job today over safety concerns and demands for a higher pay. Marina Newman reports. The workers are affiliated with the United Steelworkers Union. They went on strike just past midnight on Monday, citing no progress on talks to address complaints of worker fatigue, a lack of staffing, and a salary unable to support the rising cost of living in the San Francisco Bay Area. The strike comes after workers voted down Chevron's most recent contract offer, and the company reportedly refused to bargain further. The union reached a national agreement for a 12% increase in salary, but United Steelworkers Local 5 is asking for 5% more to keep up with Bay Area inflation. In a written statement, Chevron said that it negotiated with workers for months and believes the contract was fair and addressed union concerns. B.K. White is the vice president of United Steelworkers Local 5. He picketed outside the Richmond refinery on Monday. White told ABC7 News that many Chevron workers commute an hour to work every day because they can't afford to live closer to the job site. The cost of living in the Bay Area, as any blue-collar worker knows, has gotten to the point that it's hard to live. Our, Our workers have to live 45 minutes to an hour out. So we're just asking for a little bit of relief for a company that just reported $15.6 billion, uh, the most earnings they've had since 2014. Hours before the strike, plant management reportedly replaced union workers with non-union strike breakers. USW Local 5's BK White says that workers are trained extensively on how to operate the refinery's complex machinery, and he prays the new workers remain safe. This is a complex um, a facility. We, we do a lot of training. We have to stay current on our training every year. And somehow, magically, they came up with enough people that we've never seen before uh, run the plants. And we pray that they're safe in there. Richmond Progressive Alliance's Shiva Mishek says that the oil refinery is already prone to flaring and pollution, even with trained workers. Mishek says that Chevron's plan to operate the plant with non-union replacement workers and engineers could pose a risk to the city of Richmond. There's been a ton of risks that we deal with when the plant is being fully operated by union workers who really know their stuff, right? So we deal with flaring, um, which has a lot of, you know, toxic um, like releases a lot of toxins into the air. Um, we deal with, you know, all sorts of stuff that comes from the refinery. So it's just that the, any sort of, you know, there's fires that happen um, that, again, cause pollution issues and breathing problems for the surrounding community. So it's just that all of the risks that are already inherent to a refinery and having it right close, right next to residents is greatly exacerbated by people who don't have the same experience 
that the union workers do in running the plant. Picketers outside the refinery reported seeing some flaring from the plant. Chevron has said in a written statement that it has taken steps to continue normal operation at the plant safely and reliably and dismissed warnings that California gas prices will rise if the Richmond plant is forced to shut down. Chevron says that they anticipate no issues maintaining a reliable supply of products to the market. For KPFA News, I'm Marina Newman. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the violent repression of the largely Muslim Rohingya population in Myanmar amounts to genocide. Blinken said the administration made the determination based on confirmed accounts of mass atrocities on civilians by Myanmar's military in a widespread and systematic campaign against the Rohingya. He said officials relied on a number of sources, including the accounts of soldiers who have defected. Such as one who said he was told by his commanding officer to, and I quote, shoot at every sight of a person, end quote, burn villages, rape and kill women. Orders that he and his unit carried out. Intent is evident in the racial slurs shouted by members of the Burmese military as they attacked Rohingya. The widespread attack on mosques, the desecration of Korans. The declaration is intended to both generate international pressure and lay the groundwork for potential legal action. It's the eighth time since the Holocaust that the United States has made the determination that a genocide has occurred. Blinken noted that since the military seized power in a coup in February of last year, it's unleashed some of the same tactics on its opponents that it has used against the Rohingya minority. Since seizing power, the military has killed more than 1,670 men, women, and children, and unjustly detained at least 12,800 more in abysmal conditions. And for those who did not realize it before the coup, the brutal violence that has followed has made clear that there's no one the Burmese military won't come for. No one is safe from atrocities under its rule. And so, more people in Burma now recognize that ending this crisis, restoring the path to democracy, starts with ensuring the human rights of all people in the country, including Rohingya. Human rights groups and lawmakers have been pressing both the then Trump and the Biden administrations to make the designation of the massacre of the Rohingya as a genocide. Previous determinations of genocide by the U.S. include campaigns against Uyghurs and other largely Muslim minorities in China, as well as in Bosnia, Rwanda, Iraq, and Darfur. International aid bodies are ringing the alarm about a spiraling hunger crisis in the Sahel, the vast grassland south of the Sahara, stretching across the breadth of the African continent. Across the countries of Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, and Niger, huge numbers of people have been displaced in recent years, driven from their homes by a combination of climate change-induced drought, COVID-related food price spikes, and a patchwork of insurgencies rooted in economic deprivation. The World Food Program says that with insufficient resources to meet the unfolding crisis, it's having to take from the hungry to feed the starving. Nick Alexandra reports from South Africa. A UN helicopter touches down at a displacement camp in northern Burkina Faso whipping up a cloud of dust. It's delivering food and medical supplies for the 16,000 people who have recently arrived at this camp outside the town of Gorum Gorum, seeking safety and assistance. This is just one of many across the Sahel, sheltering refugees and internally displaced people. Ibrahim is a member of the Adina people who herd cattle and fish around Lake Chad. When his village was attacked by armed insurgents, he and his family fled for their lives. We walked for two days without food or water. We arrived here and the people of the village welcomed us and we explained what we had been through. The village chief gave us a place to settle and then some international people brought us food and arranged schooling for our children. Now Ibrahim and his family are part of the growing numbers of people in the region who need support to survive. 
In the past three years, the number of those in need across the Sahel has skyrocketed. The World Food Program director, David Beasley, says people seeking aid have been chased from their homes by extremist groups, starved by drought and plunged into despair by COVID's economic ripple effects. You have climate change, conflict, COVID economic deterioration, and now price spiking for food, and it has created catastrophe for millions, around 11 million people here in the Sahel area don't know where their next meal is coming from. And if they don't get the help they need right now, I mean immediately, we're talking about starvation, migration, and destabilization. Let's give these people the help they need now. The Malian singer Vieux Farcature, son of the legendary Ali Farcature, told the UN that he has been disturbed by the deteriorating security in his home country, which leads people to desperate choices just to feed their families. Everyone is dangerous here now. I'm sure okay. every time. Because now you see, sometimes you, you sit down and they, somebody gonna tell you, oh, okay, uh, somebody take a gun and kill somebody because he's a bicycle. You see? So just kill, for hundred dollars you kill somebody. That's, that's because the people don't have nothing to eat. It's, it's real, like the people, they don't have nothing to eat. You know, they need money, they need work. While the number of people needing help is rising dramatically, capacity to feed them is falling. Funding shortages for Niger, for example, mean that the World Food Program is forced to cut food rations in half. <laughs> to attract the world's attention to this crisis, Vera Farcatore is promoting a new composition called Song for the Sahel. He says, that as a child of the region, and as an artist whose sound is born out of the Sahel, he feels an obligation to draw people's consciousness to this pressing crisis. Nick Alexandra, KPFA, Johannesburg. And an elected official from New Mexico is said to be the second person tried on charges stemming from the Capitol insurrection. Federal judge in Washington, D.C. will hear testimony without a jury for Otero County Commissioner Coy Griffin's trial. Griffin charged with illegally entering Capitol grounds, but not the Capitol building itself. Griffin is a former rodeo writer and a former pastor. He helped found a political committee called Cowboys for Trump. In a court filing, prosecutors called him an inflammatory provocateur and fabulist who engages in racist, invective, and propounds baseless conspiracy theories, including that communist China stole the 2020 presidential election. Griffin's attorneys say hundreds, if not thousands, of other people did exactly what Griffin did on January 6th and haven't been charged with any crimes. A Chinese Boeing 737-800 with 132 people on board has crashed in southern China in the country's worst air disaster in nearly a decade. The Civil Aviation Administration of China said the flight had been traveling at around 30,000 feet when it suddenly entered a deep dive. The the data suggests the plane crashed within a minute and a half of whatever went wrong. State media reported all Boeing 737-800s in China's eastern fleet were ordered grounded after the crash. Sunny skies predicted for the San Francisco Bay Area tomorrow with a high near 70 around the bay. Even warmer inland in the low 80s. Further inland, sunny with highs in the low 80s in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow. And in Los Angeles, the high under sunny skies will be in the upper 80s. That's it for the news tonight for this Monday, March 21st. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. This is Alice Walker. In these difficult times, I can't imagine living in a world without KPFA. Please donate what you can today. Hi, this is Jeff Chang. For years, KPFA has been a beacon for all of us in times of political darkness and lack of hope. Let's stand with KPFA now. Please donate what you can today. 
Hi folks, this is Rebecca Gordon. We're living through some pretty hard times these days, and I can't imagine doing it without KPFA. Please donate whatever you can today. Thank you. Donate today at kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.